Hi folks, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion about burnout. I'm Jen Kearney, I'm a Digital Communications Manager for McLean Hospital, and I'm joined today by Dr. Lisa Coyne. And burnout, it's not a condition that appears overnight. It's a long-term sum of exhaustion, combined with being overwhelmed, stressed, and even overworked. And despite the fact that burnout is often associated with jobs, it can happen at home as well. So uh, I'm thrilled to have Lisa with me today to talk about how we can temper burnout, address the symptoms, and keep it from happening altogether. If you are unfamiliar with her, Lisa Coyne, PhD, is an assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry part-time at Harvard Medical School and is a senior clinical consultant at the Child and Adolescent OCD Institute at McLean Hospital. So Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. And I just wanted to kick and I just wanted to kick it off by actually asking you, what's burnout? I know it gets talked about a lot, but the definition can be pretty unclear. I think so. And I think probably if you're listening, you've experienced it. And I know I've experienced it. And Jen, you probably have too in our various roles and jobs and positions and things like that. Um, and just we also recently, several weeks ago, we did um, one of these on parent burnout, but today we're going to talk about job burnout. And when we talk about that, it's a work-related stress. So it's considered a state of physical or emotional exhaustion that also involves a sense of that you're not really accomplishing what you want to or what you're capable of and a loss of your personal identity, where you might start questioning, is this the job for you? Were you cut out for this? Can you really handle this, et cetera? Um, and so there are some things, you know, if you're starting to one, and it, it can, one, one of the things that I notice about it, and I'm sure, you know, many of us have experienced this throughout our lives, it's not a medical condition, it's not a diagnosed psychological disorder, but it's something that's very real. And it's something that can happen to anyone. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about risk factors and things like that. But some things that you might want to, you know, notice and assess in yourself if you're starting to feel like maybe you're feeling a little burned out is have you become cynical or very critical of yourself or others or where you work while you're at work? You know, that's one thing. Is it hard to get yourself to go to work? Has the joy gone out of it for you? You know, is it having, is it difficult for you to get started going in the morning? Are you starting to feel like it's a grind? How are you interacting with other folks to the degree that you are at work or you're still on, you know, quarantined at home? I know we're, in, at least in Massachusetts, beginning to venture out. But that might be short-lived given that the COVID cases are increasing in many states, Massachusetts included. So have you been irritable or Im impatient with other people at your work, right? Whether it's customers, clients, or coworkers, do you feel like maybe you just don't have the energy to be consistently productive? Does it start to feel a little Sisyphean? Um, if you remember the myth of Sisyphus, if you read anything in the Greek mythology, pushing that rock up the hill only to have it roll down again and pushing it up the hill again. Um, so when I think about burnout, I think a lot about Sisyphus and what does it feel like um, to continually do that over and over again. Other things to look out for. Is it different, difficult for you to concentrate when in the past it has been easy? When you feel like you've achieved something, um, do you have difficulty celebrating that? Do you not feel satisfied? Like, yeah, you did this, but there's so much more that has to be done. So all of these things. Um, some of the things that are corollaries to this when you start to feel this way is that you might have started using some coping strategies that may or may not be so helpful, like uncontrolled eating, like turning to alcohol or turning to drugs to do something to feel better or feel less in some way. Um, so those are things like that. And there are some physical things that may occur when you're experiencing stressors, like your sleep habits may have changed, 
right? You may have difficulty sleeping. You might be experiencing physical stress, some signs of anxiety, like muscle tension, like unexplained headaches, like stomach upsets and things like that. So there's lots and lots of things that can feed into it. That's a very long answer to your question, Jen. <laughs> And it's a, although it's a really important for people to know that that's, you know, there are a lot of symptoms and there's a lot of reasons as to why something you might feel a certain kind of way when you're at your job and right. it's actually attributable to burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's definitely, I think one of the things to look out for is, is it a change, right? Where previously you were coping, happy. I mean, not all of us love our jobs. Some of us do if we're lucky. Some of us don't. But is there a significant change in what's happening? And it also has to do with sort of feeling like you are experiencing uncontrolled stressors that are beyond your ability. You're overwhelmed by them. Right? So when we start to feel like we're dealing with too many things, it can, you can certainly be at risk for this. And I did want to, before I jump into a couple more questions I received in advance, I did want to let people know in order to ask a question, uh, if you are joining us from your computer, the Q&A option is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen, so you can submit it there. Um, but one of the questions that I received was, is there a difference between being worn out and burnt out? And how can you actually tell when you've tipped from one to the other? It's a really good question. It's an interesting one, too. Um, and I don't know that I have a good answer for it because I'm not sure what, the, what you know, that listener's definition of being worn out is. Um, when I think of being worn out myself, I think about like feeling like I'm exhausted from the many things that I have to do during the day, right? I think that when this becomes chronic, that's when it starts to turn towards burnout. Um, you know, when you just have a discrete change in how you feel about your work, about your ability to be at work, about your own estimation of your abilities and things like that. And I think humans are very flexible and adaptive creatures, all of us, right? Um, but when you start to feel like, you know, kind of numb, kind of down, kind of stressed, kind of not finding the joy in things, and it's persistent, I think that that matters. But probably the best way to think about this is, What's your threshold, right? Like when are, when are you unwilling to deal with something? You know, what's for each of us? Like when does it become like, you know what? This is not okay with me to feel this way about my job, about myself, about my abilities, right? I need help or I need a change. And I think those are the points that are really important to look for just for each of us personally. Like what does that mean? What does that look like? I'm not always so good at noticing them in myself, you know, just to give you an example, I work pretty long days and I really love my work. I really love it. So when I start to feel less like I love it, that's a danger sign for me that I'm starting to shift into getting worn out. And then if I don't do anything about it to make a change, either in something that's within my control, like, can I dial back? Um, can I work more efficiently? Can I make sure that I planfully include some time for self-care and some balance, right? That's when you start to get at risk for burnout, I think. So when I know that you work, you're in a high position at your job, you work a lot independently on your own. What happens when you're not at that level and you don't actually feel like you have the personal authority to take a step back and say, I feel overwhelmed? Um, I know I've been in jobs where I have yeah. not this one, but I've actually, I felt concerned that bringing it up, I saying I feel overwhelmed, I'm burnt out, uh, I'm gonna be looked down on or that they're going to view it as I actually can't do my job. Do you have any advice for handling that type of situation? Yeah, first just to normalize that. And I've been in jobs like that as well, um, where you know anybody who's ever been in an academic job anywhere <laughs> knows that. You know, what, we, all, we all start on the ground oh floor. Oh my goodness, Absolutely. exactly, right? You know, there's kind of all of the many things that you're required to do and then all of the things that, um, you know, it's a little bit different sometimes than the job description. So I think it's normal to feel that way. And I think 
the stigma around like, what if my boss, like, if I say I'm struggling, I'll get in trouble. You know, I'll be looked down on. I think that stigma is something that people feel. And unfortunately, it's something that prevents people from advocating for themselves when they most need it, right? And so one way to think about this is, you know, it's important to value yourself. And when you value yourself and you care for yourself in ways um, that uh, support your um, psychological well-being, right, you're going to work more efficiently. You're going to be a better um, employee. You're going to bring more verve to your job. You're going to have your downtime when you have your downtime and things like that. And it's really easy to get stuck in the hamster wheel and just think, I just got to work, 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 work. I've been there, really. Um, so I think framing it, I would encourage people to ask for if you have an EAP, an employee assistance program, that's something that many businesses have where it's confidential. You can go and you can um, seek help. Sometimes it's free, which is really wonderful. There are lots of resources online to start doing some work around things like mindfulness. Um, and then there's, you know, seeking help outside. But then there's also talking to your boss about like, this is tough and I'm concerned. And like one way I might frame it is um, to have a conversation like that with your boss when you feel like you're not able to do it is this job is important to me and I want to make sure that I am at the peak of my powers for you. And I also want to acknowledge that I am struggling a little bit with X, Y, or Z. And I'm wondering, and I'm bringing that to your attention because I want to make sure I'm doing everything that I can in the best way that I can in this position. So I'm wondering if you have suggestions for how best to handle that. Um, or some variety of that. Not all bosses are going to hear that well. But framing it in that way, first with what's most important to you, the value, and then this is the hard piece that I have to say. And then not demanding, but asking and seeing, you know, is there anything that we can do about this? Um, and you can extend it to here are some things I think would be helpful, you know, and maybe you'll get those functional changes or maybe you won't. But framing it in that way, I think, might make it easier for um, employers to hear that I totally encourage folks who are feeling burned out to seek some support, whether that's hanging out with your friends, whether that's taking a walk at night, whether that's going to your EAP, whether it's doing yoga, practicing mindfulness, any of those things. It's really, really important. Um, and putting some balance back in, in your life, because that's something that's definitely a risk factor. So if you're a boss or you're managing multiple people, how do you advise breaking the ice with your own employees to say, you know, I am concerned. I, you know, especially since working in healthcare, mm. so many of us, especially because of COVID are stressed right. or burnt out. Um, right. Can you help break that cycle? Or I guess you even 100% if you're, can. Even if you're not a manager, how can you help break that cycle with yourself and the people around you? Right. So I think, so I'm going to give a couple of answers to this. So I am a boss and it is so important to me that the people who work for and with me have balance in their lives um, and that they feel that they can tell me or ask me when they need help. So I think a lot about as a, a boss or a manager, investing in your team, it's really important. And holding people accountable and also making a space for them to come with struggles. So it's a balance that's so important. But you know, the other thing that's important to consider is what are things that lead to or that contribute to um, burnout, okay? And some of these things are things that managers or bosses or even coworkers or supervisors can, can really look at. And so one is, um, and I'll go through several of these, one is feeling like you have a lack of control at your work, right? 
So feeling like if you are unable to influence decisions that affect your job, like your schedule, like your assignments, your workload, that can lead to burnout, okay? So could a lack of resources that you need to do your work. And this is something that we see over and over and over, okay? So keeping an open line of communication about that, about what are the needs? How can I support you, right? How can I find some flexibility for you um, as an employee? Those are important. The second thing that can contribute to burnout is really unclear job expectations, okay? So not really understanding what's expected. Um, when employees feel like that, they're not necessarily uncomfortable or feeling like, you know, this is my job and yet I'm being asked to do all of these other things. That's, that's something that can contribute to that. Not understanding a role, so not understanding a clear role, like where are the limits of my job? Where like beyond that, I don't have to do that, that's someone else's job and staying within that. So to the degree that supervisors or managers can do that for their employees, that's really important. Um, sometimes things go on in the workplace that are really challenging, right? So if there is a dysfunctional dynamic at the workplace, like perhaps there's a bully, perhaps there's sexual harassment that's going on, perhaps there is someone who is undermining you on purpose or your boss is micromanaging, these can contribute to job stress, which can lead to burnout. Um, and this is something that depending on how closely you know, a supervisor or a boss manages, they may or may not know about. Um, and so I think really meeting employees where they are and really listening to what's going on here and addressing that um, in really pragmatic ways is important. When you have a job where it's either really, really monotonous or it's very chaotic, that can lead to fatigue and job burnout. So making sure that you have, if it's very, very monotonous, some breaks, some things that are fun, some team building activities, things like that. Um, if you feel isolated at your work or your personal life, you might feel more stressed. So not having social support. So seeing if there's a way to build in some windows for that during the day at work. And then finally, um, if your work just eats up your whole life, and that's true for a lot of us, I think. Um, that's really, really uh, hard. And that's something that um, can lead to burnout quickly. So these are things that managers can consider that are contextual factors that might contribute to burnout. So on the front end, dealing with these as they arise effectively can head burnout off of the pass. Um, I mean, I think that's all incredibly good to know. I also know that working in the mental health field, it almost seems like we have a little bit more empathy toward yeah. what others are experiencing, or at least we're encouraged to have that empathy a little bit more publicly than in other fields. Have yeah. you have you found that working in mental health for as long as you have makes identifying your own burnout or your staff's burnout easier than in other fields? That's a really good question because I'm trying to think like, have I have actually worked in other fields, but it's been a really long time. <laughs> um, you know, I think that empathy is really important, right? In, in managers and bosses and also in teams. And one of the things that I think you can bring to any workplace is how can, is consideration of how can we build a collaborative culture, like a pro-social collaborative culture, where some of these things, um, you know, are sort of baked into the culture. And so there's a really interesting group that I have been working with, and they call themselves the Pro-Social Institute. And what they do is they consult and they do all sorts of sort of industrial organizational things. And I was, I've been working with bank managers and city planners and other psychologists and educational professionals. And they are all participating in this work called ProSocial, which involves building a collaborative culture, right? Whether it's in your city or your team in your workplace. And a couple of things that are really important are 
emphasizing, um, well, they built this on, I don't know if people have ever heard of this person, but Eleanor Ostrom was an economist who won a Nobel Prize for her work in how to manage resources collaboratively. And she came up with eight principles and they're not complicated. They're things like fairness, equity, um, communication, feeling like you have control over making decisions, feeling like when there are things that are um, helpful that you know people do, that they're reinforced. And when people are doing things that are unhelpful, that there are graduated sanctions for dealing with those. Um, and there's eight of these. And so building groups and teams that have those or that reflect those actually um, can contribute to really, really comfortable workplaces where people are less likely to burn out. And then the other piece that's really important is one that we call psychological flexibility. And this is something that there's a lot of research on in terms of its role in burnout, both in contributing to it when people are inflexible, um, but also, you know, contributing to maybe less healthy coping strategies when once you are burned out, right? Like doing things like uncontrolled eating. So psychological flexibility simply means um, allowing yourself to feel what you feel and think what you think when you're experiencing it without being super critical, right? And also being able to shift your behavior um, when it matters to you and when it's effective rather than keep trying the same thing over and over and over again, right? So an example of somebody who, you know, might be less psychologically flexible is somebody who is experiencing a lot of symptoms of burnout, but refusing to change, unwilling to talk to the boss about it, telling themselves, you have to, you just have to keep doing this no matter what, right? That's a very rigid way of dealing with that. And it's not sustainable. Whereas somebody who might be psychologically flexible with burnout might say, wow, okay, what's in my control that I can change? What's out of my control that I have to accept and make space for? And how can I carry that more gently, right? How can I take care of myself around the edges if I'm going to ask myself to do this very difficult work every day? So how do we motivate ourselves to actually get that psychological flexibility so we can start relieving stress when we realize it's happening and fight off burnout? So for a lot of us, <laughs> it starts when we start noticing that what, whatever it is we're doing isn't working, <laughs> right? And I think that lots of us, we live in a culture where it's not, as you said, Jen, like, you know, in, in psychology, we're empathic we're taught to um you know notice how we're feeling we're taught to express our emotions and all of this stuff and maybe in other fields people are not but you know culturally there's a lot of rules that we have about like what's okay to express and what's not okay and it differs across gender for example like for guys much more acceptable to be angry and stressed not so much for women but for women, it's okay to be sad and anxious, not so much for guys. And there are these subtle differences. Um, but we also live in a culture where sometimes we think of having extremes of emotion as very bad and as stigmatizing, right? So if you start policing, you know, are you feeling the right level of emotion? Is it okay to say you're struggling um, or you're sad? That's when we start to go that route of psychological inflexibility where we're kind of um, being very critical and trying to manage and hem that in, right? Now, being psychologically flexible doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna emote all the time to everyone in every situation, but it does mean that you're okay with whatever you're, you're making a space for. It, you can take it off the list of stuff that you have to be self-critical about. Um, so I think the first thing is, noticing if you feel like you're in a struggle all the time and stuff isn't working you might want to think about what can you start putting down what strategies are unhelpful right the second step would be once you start putting down those attempts to suppress how you're feeling to bottle it up or 
get rid of it in some way or manage it, you might just kind of slow down, take your time and spend some time checking in with yourself and noticing what, what is actually going on. Have a conversation with yourself about your work, about how you feel about being at work, about how the workload is working for you. And just let yourself go there, right? This is, this involves two things, right? One is mindfulness, right? Mindful awareness of how you're thinking and feeling in context. And two is acceptance, right? It's, it's not tolerating, but simply taking a look at, this is what's going on right now for me. Um, and those are two really good first steps towards moving through something, right? The third step would be thinking about well, what is in my control that I can actually do about this and what is not. And what am I willing to accept and what am I not willing to accept, right? So if you have an abusive boss, if you have a terribly toxic workplace, is that something you're really willing to accept? And if you're not, that's going to raise some other questions. Maybe it's time to move on and move out. Okay. Or maybe it's time to think about what can you actually do to change things by speaking up. So two examples. Did that answer that? I hope it did. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So um, I know that you had mentioned about the burnout in the workplace and, you know, trying to change scenarios when you can. And we did get a couple questions about um, burnout in your job. And one individual asked, what do you do if you love the work that you're currently doing in the mental health field, but your rapport with your supervisors declined because of a disagreement about job pay? I'm working to the mm. best of my ability, but I'm still overwhelmed. Would this be burnout? I don't know that that's burnout as much as that's a really tough situation, right? Um, and it's a hard situation because you love your work and yet maybe you can't live on the pay. And that's a very real situation. Um, salaries and mental health aren't great. We all know that um, salaries, lots of people are out of work right now, which is even harder. So I think that that's one of those choice points really where it's time to have a conversation with yourself about, am I willing to work for this amount? in the service of doing what I love, right? And if the answer is yes, that means yes. That means, yeah, my paycheck's gonna be small. It's not gonna be a lot of money. And there's a reason I'm doing this. And maybe my reason is I love what I do. Maybe it's an opportunity to continue learning something that you wouldn't get anywhere else. Um, it may not be in your supervisor's control to change your salary either. That's the other thing. So just noticing that. But if the answer is, I really love this, and also I cannot afford to continue doing this, then you have to have another conversation with yourself about is it time to move on? Is it time to look for something different? Can you find, you know, something that you love um, that pays a little bit better, right? So these are the kinds of things that when I was – young or young because we're not old right Jen you're, right? Still, you're still young come on <laughs> anyway so I, I remember being in college and just after college you know taking my first jobs in mental health and you know I didn't make I mean didn't make anything really but that wasn't what was important what was important to me back then was I wanted to learn right and I would make do if that meant I eat ramen all week, I eat ramen all week, but I wanted to learn, right? Um, if, but again, it's, you know, there's such income disparity in at least this country, and I know other countries too, it's really tough um, when rents and things have gone up so high and salaries have not made commensurate gains. So it's a different situation. So I don't know, I mean, but I think ask yourself that question Am I willing, really am I willing to say yes to all of this as it is? Because this piece about salary is not in my control. And really be intentional about the why when you go to work. 
this is about a value. This is about something that's important to me. And if the answer is no, I would start getting your resume out there and start thinking about that. That would be my advice. So if you're in a job that you don't actually feel is right for you, because I know that we, we have folks who are joining us who love their jobs, but don't necessarily think it's still square peg round hole when it comes to mm. finances. But if the job itself isn't the right fit for you, is there a way to separate feeling burnt out because of what's happening in our environment around us? Like, oh, I don't know, a pandemic or <laughs> just because. You're like, or, oh, that thing, that old thing, that if, pandemic. <laughs> Jeez, or, or just feeling burnt out because you don't think the job is a good fit for you and vice versa. Well, I want to distinguish between those two things. I mean, burnout is not the same thing as feeling like this job isn't right for me, right? I mean, I think that we're talking about, on one hand, we're talking about sort of feeling overwhelmed by stress in a job that you've chosen. And in this other situation, there's a very real like, well, maybe this isn't the job for me. I'm not great at this. Or I don't love this work. Um, and again, it's, a, it's another opportunity for one of those willingness questions, right? Like, let's say, so my first job out of, of college, right? I had a, I was a nerd and I had a triple major because <laughs> I liked school. Maybe I was just scared to leave school. Who knows? But my very first job, I worked as a technical editor. I lived in Ireland and I had a team of writers underneath me because I had one of my degrees was in English. And the reason I took this job was to support my family. We had an elderly family member who had had a stroke. And so we wanted to contribute and we wanted to be over there so we could support that person. And I took this job because there weren't other jobs available. And I could do the job. I had the skills to do the job. I hated that job. <laughs> I hated it. And I loved the people that I worked with. They were lovely. But I mean, those two hour meetings about the Oxford comma, you know, it was actually one of the things that led me back into psych. Um, and that was different. But again, that's, this is an opportunity for a question, right? Am I willing to stay in this job that is not a good fit for me? Given that, it helps me support my family, right? So thinking about how can you be intentional about your job? How can you make your job about something else, right? Or something that's more important to you, that can help a lot. And that kept me going until the time was done when our stint there was over, right? Um, and it made, it made, it didn't change the work, but it helps me carry it more lightly in the sense that I was more flexible and I was more willing to be there. And I was like, you could kind of laugh at like all the, you know, yes, I do believe in the Oxford comma and yes, you should use it. Um, <laughs> grammar saves lives. That's, yes. That's one of my favorite. Very important. The, 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 the let's eat grandma versus let's eat comma grandma. Yes. <laughs> 100%. So. Um, yeah. And so I think that's one way to deal with that. And the other thing too, is to think about, don't be black and white about things. Notice when you are. So it's not like everything is not perfect about this job. Therefore I must leave. It's, there are parts, there's parts to every job that we don't like, right? Every single job. There's no, there's no perfect in the world. I mean, at least I haven't found it yet. Maybe you guys have lucky you, but noticing when you're kind of like, swinging to these extreme ways of solving a problem versus kind of, okay, what's in our control? What's not in our control? What can, what do we have the agency to shift? And what do we have to say yes to if we want to stay, right? What do we need to choose to accept? And that's that acceptance piece again. And when I say acceptance, I do not mean to endure or tolerate. Okay. That's not what it's about. That's when you haven't really said yes to stay, when you're still kind of struggling with it. It's, you know what, this is going to suck and here I go. I'm going to stay. Does that make sense? 
the kombucha. Are you I think so. Kombucha? Oh no, this is my uh, reusable tumbler. So oh, very I just cool. don't, I just don't have a straw top. So to avoid spilling it all over myself in the middle of a webinar, I use the straw. Very important. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I know you were talking about being in a job that supports your family. What happens when you have a really demanding job and you're a caregiver, when you're either a parent or when you're caring for either a parent or a child? How do you avoid burning out? Because I know it's, you know, the burning the candle at both ends is true. And I know plenty of parents who are trying oh, yeah. to juggle 100%. that that work, that work from home, but also working at home with your family dichotomy. And I think that that's really, really important because I think that that is a huge risk for burnout, that situation where work is work and work is also life. Um, so if you are privileged enough to have people that you can reach out to in your family who can help, if you can take turns and roles, that's super helpful. Um, so it's another example where flexibility can be helpful in families. So for example, if you have very specific roles about who does what, maybe specific cultural ideas about who does what, maybe those are opportunities to look and say, can we do anything differently so that we can each have breaks when we need them, you know, and when you take your breaks, if you're able to work them in, I think making sure that you use them wisely right? What, I mean, maybe you just need to sit down and take a nap. Maybe you want to escape through reading a book. Maybe you want to take a walk, get your, yourself moving and going. Exercise can help with raising mood and things like that. Um, maybe you want to connect with someone that you haven't connected with in a while. So thinking about things that can feed you, things that you enjoy doing, um, that you can work into your day, not and don't skimp on them. I think that's really important. I think that, you know, we often, especially in, in American culture, have the notion that like the more productive we are, the more valuable or worthy we are. And that's such a dangerous path to go down. You know, you're worthy just as you are and you're valuable just as you are. You don't have to do one other thing. You're worthy because you're on the planet and you deserve care and you deserve peace, and you deserve love, right? So making sure that even when it feels like, no, but I have so many other things to do, I just can't take a moment, you can take a small break, even if it's a couple of minutes. Walk outside, sit on your front stoop, and let the sun hit your face, you know? Slow down, you know, um, just have linger over your coffee a little bit longer. See if you can work in even little micro breaks and really be mindful about noticing that this is something that you are giving to yourself, okay? Those things can be really, really helpful. So would you consider that really the first step toward rediscovering joy and meaning and making your life feel worthwhile even when you're acknowledging that you're burnt out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the first step is acknowledging that you're burnt out. <laughs> So maybe that would be the that second brings, step. That brings more meaning already. <laughs> there you go. Like it is what it is. And um, I don't know if I said this in another webinar, but there's a Buddhist psychologist. Her name is Tara Brock. And she has this thing at the saying that just really stuck with me. And she said, suffering begins the moment we begin to wish that the present moment is different than it is. So let that sink in for a second right and again there are always there may be things that are within our control to change and one of the predictors of burnout of course is uncontrollable stressors right so as much as we try to ignore ignore suppress deny all that you know making a space that this is a thing you know we are this is a struggle and this is really difficult that's the first step yes this is hard yes you are in it and maybe it won't be forever. But acknowledging you're burned out, making a space for the stuff that you're feeling. And the third thing is, how can you be intentional um, in handling this? So can you guys still hear me? I'm getting messages that my connection is unstable. You are back now. You were okay. paused for probably about 15 seconds. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. I didn't say anything important. So. 
<laughs> I think your I think your Wi-Fi is also experiencing some burnout. Yeah, my Wi-Fi has been burned out all week. <laughs> yes. So what would you what would you say would be an, an effective way to recover from burnout? Is there I I know that it's like, you know, there is no one true prescription for everybody, but what would you say is a really good first step to starting that recovery? Um, unless you already said it and I missed it. So I'm sorry about there's that. A, no, there's a lot of different things you can do. So I think the first thing, I think the theme, I, you know, I want to keep saying is think about what your options are and think about what things are in your control and what things are not. So asking for help, whether that means talking to your supervisor working together with them to see if you can change some expectations at work, compromise, or find a solution, um, and prioritizing things at work. They, these are little things that you, some are big things, but, you know, figuring out, like, how can you, are you, are you holding yourself to impossible standards, right? And if you are, think about what is it feasible for me to accomplish today? Make a small list and go ahead and do those things that can be you know a small thing that you can do and that's one that i often do actually um you know in in getting through my days is thinking through like what needs to get done what can i do with the time that i'm given and then it's very reinforcing to tick those boxes um the second thing you can do is you can seek support you know whether it's talking to your coworkers, to friends or loved ones you know get some support about how you might cope and again, going to an EAP might be helpful if there is one, right? Take advantage of the services that are out there. Another thing that you can do would be to get moving or get relaxing, you know? Do some things to help you manage your own stress. Do some yoga, um, you know, learn mindfulness, meditation, take a walk, you know? Um, get moving because all of those things can be helpful for your physical health and your psychological well-being. Um, get enough sleep if you can. That's really important. So first medicine, right, is, is a phrase that sometimes people are using. When we think about sleep, exercise, and good nutritious food, take care of those basics and those will really help. So those would be some of the things that, would, you know, are really good steps in dealing with burnout. I know you've talked a lot about mindfulness um, and we do have folks that are asking how mindfulness and resiliency um, contribute to burnout, how they're connected to burnout and does burnout happen because you have a lack of resiliency? My gut says no. My gut says is that you have more resilience and that's why you're trying to push through and you may get burnt out because of it, but mm -hmm. I defer to the expert. So I don't want to, oversimplify but I think that like when I think about the things that contribute to burnout I, there are two sort of classes there are contextual factors that may or may not be in your control situations at work but there are also coping strategies that are helpful or unhelpful and resilience basically means right that when you get hit with stuff you can drop and roll and figure it out and move forward even when it's hard right and you can persist at the heart of that is that idea of psychological flexibility right and the ingredients are allowing yourself to feel what you're feeling when you're feeling it and thinking thinking it right instead of trying to suppress control manage it and choosing to do things that are important to you that are consistent with who you are as a person or the person that you most want to be um, and doing that flexibly as afforded by the situation, right? So mindfulness is something that is woven into that idea of psychological flexibility, right? Because in order to really be flexible and to be psychologically flexible, it means being mindful about what is going on for you in this moment right now, and learning to stay in this moment so that you can choose what are your next best steps? What's the next right thing for you to do? Um, so I think that those two concepts go hand in hand, 
often can be really, really helpful, especially when you're dealing with uncontrollable stressors that you cannot shift or change, right? And we all have situations in our lives, and if you don't now, you will in the future, that there are plenty of things that are out of our control that we just can't change. Um, and so how do you handle that, right? Wishing them away doesn't work. Ignoring them doesn't work. So maybe leaning into them as they are and then taking whatever steps that you can to take care of yourself in those moments. So do you have any advice on how to reduce stress in the moment? Does that, could it be something as simple as a breathing exercise? Yeah, so this is a fun thing. And I, this is when I actually do quite a lot. So I'm gonna ask the listeners a quick question. You know, if you think about your day, 100% of your day, what percent of your time are you here now, just in this moment, not worried about what you have to do next, thinking about things that are going to happen, maybe or maybe not in the future, and not worrying about stuff you didn't do, didn't do well enough, still have to do from the past, you know, and really thinking about how much time am I actually just in this moment, right? So if you're like me, and like lots of people, you're probably observing that you're actually probably not just here right now, letting yourself rest in this moment very much at all. It's like the lights are on, but nobody's home because you're off in the future or you're off in the past. And when we work with our teenagers, we, talk, we call this time traveling. Okay. And minds are wonderful things. They let you go all over the place. One thing you can do to reduce your stress is to notice where you are in your mind and bring yourself right here to this moment, right? And notice that in this moment, right this second, what's going on? Um, again, Tara Brock had another really lovely saying that I think was very useful. And she said, anxiety cannot live long in the present moment. And so what I encourage folks to do is start to develop a practice of noticing where where's my mind am i off worrying about the future or the past can i bring it here now and just notice the world with my five senses right so i'm noticing it's there's a lovely breeze in the trees outside our house the sky is blue which is really lovely it's not always so so blue it's lovely and warm but not too hot in the shade that's comfortable okay so practicing that just little throughout the day just for a few seconds at a time where am i and can i bring myself to this moment right now cultivating that practice will help you with stress you know and in that moment making friends with whatever you're thinking or feeling you know whether it's a moment of doubt or fear or overwhelm that's okay everything that you're feeling and thinking is okay i would start there so in terms of what you're thinking and feeling, what happens if we have troublesome thoughts and feelings? How do we help manage those that might contribute to burnout? Hmm. So what I do, and <laughs> what I teach people to do, and of course, what I'm teaching you guys to do is, you know, embedded in a number of traditions of psychotherapy, right? Mindfulness-based stress reduction, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. There are many, okay? And so what I do is I'm one of those people that doesn't often, because I'm, I do work so much, um, I don't often notice if I'm anxious or stressed. Instead, I have headaches or I have muscle tension. My back hurts. My shoulder gets tight and there's that knot again or I'm suddenly tired and why am I so fatigued all the time? And so the first thing I do is I'll pause and I will check in with myself and go, what were you just thinking? And I'll wait and be like, oh yeah, I thought about that assignment that was hanging over my head, that article review I didn't do, that session that didn't go so well, that person I disappointed, whatever it is. And I'll simply give it a nod, notice that I had the thought, and I'll kind of give myself permission to not solve it and just let it be. Right. So that's what I would encourage you guys to do as well is cultivate that practice. 
And now the goal of this practice is not to make stress, anxiety, scary thoughts, hard thoughts go away. In fact, you probably have already noticed that that's not really possible, right? Trying not to think things. I could tell you not to think about something and you pretty much go ahead and think about it um, despite your best efforts. And that's not just you, that's everybody, right? Um, we're not built to, you know, effectively really uh, ignore our thoughts, right? But what we can do is we can treat them differently, okay? So I would treat scary thoughts the same way you might treat a thought like, my, I left my keys on the counter today, or um, my glasses are, have a black frame. Yeah, and, right? Those thoughts don't seem to have much of an emotional punch or anything. They're just thoughts, just like any other thoughts. And we have between 40 and 70,000 of them a day. So you're going to have scary thoughts. All of us are. And we're never not going to, I mean, sometimes you won't notice them. Sometimes you will notice them. But treating that, them like they're not really important data, letting them come and go as they will, and noticing the process of your thinking rather than getting tangled up in what you're thinking about is going to be more helpful. Um, so that is a skill and act that we call defusion, D-E, not D-I, defusion which simply means noticing thoughts as just for what they are. They're mental weather that like come to us given our learning history, you know, and our physical makeup. We're not in charge of the content of them. Of course not. You know, our learning history is all the experiences we ever had are. So no need to really figure them out unless it's helpful for you to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I really like the phrase mental weather because especially living in New England over the summer, tumultuous thunderstorms all the time, all but the time. they don't but they don't last forever. The darkness right. comes and it goes and it blows through. So I think mental weather is a really great way of looking at it. Yeah, and the other thing to remember too is that we're kind of like the sky and thoughts don't make up who we are. You're not who you are because you think it a particular way. Your thoughts are going to come and go. You're the observer of those thoughts. You're like the sky, and that sky is going to change colors with the weather. That's okay. I think that's a really uplifting way of looking at it, too, and especially since we all can look outside and see the sky. It's the mm -hmm. sky exists everywhere that everybody exists. So, yep. Um, I know we have about five more minutes, so I did want to cover a few person specific questions that came through. Um, and then we will wrap it up with one all encompassing question. Uh, okay. So let's, let's see how rapid fire we can do this. I don't know. I'm pretty through. burned out from this, Jen. I'm not sure I can do it. <laughs> so the first question that we had come through that was person specific was I'm irritable, angry, and critical all the time. How much of this has to do with being newly sober 11 months now, which mm. congratulations, congratulations and being in recovery and how much of this is attributable to burnout? Good question. And I would answer that with another question. How can you be gentle with yourself for being irritable and angry and make a space for those feelings to be there without fighting with them and seeing how to carry them more lightly, you know? And so one of the first things that we do sometimes when we're feeling something that's difficult, right? And I, I really applaud you for for being 11 months sober, that's awesome. Um, how can you care for yourself and be gentle? Give yourself permission to feel these things and not struggle with them and not try to manage them, right? Um, as you carry them and as you experience them. And when you're feeling that way, when you're irritable and angry, how can you take the next best step for you? Right? Do you want to let yourself get pushed around by these feelings? Or when they are there, let go of struggling with that. Think about what's the person, what would the person I want to become? Or my best self, what would that person do in this moment right now? You know, I've never found it super helpful for beating myself up for feeling angry and irritable. And certainly I have felt my share of those as well. And sometimes those feelings are really helpful and informative, right? Because feelings are information. 
So the other thing to think about is, what are they trying to tell you? What's making you irritable? Is that a sign that maybe you need to take a break and give yourself some gentleness? Um, anger, that can come up so many different ways. What message does it have for you? What's it trying to say? You know, what's useful about that? Anger, anger can be very motivating in some ways. It can be very helpful. Um, in some ways, it can, if we're not mindful of it and we're struggling with it, we can lash out we can vent and that can hurt others. So think about what if you didn't work on managing those, but instead thought about, okay, these are part of life. I don't love them. And wow, I would love for them to not be here with me right now. And also what's the next right thing for me to do in the presence of this? How can I do that? And I think that that might be a more fruitful approach. I think that's a great answer. Um, so the next one we have that's person specific is- I, I want to thank that person for the question too. I really appreciate that question. And I'm thinking about all the many times I've been really angry and made wrong moves. So good for you. Best wishes to you. I think there was a quote, I can't remember what religion it was attributed to, but it was that holding on to anger is like setting yourself on fire and waiting for somebody else to burn. Yeah. It can be like that. Exactly. Yep. Um, all right. Got two minutes left. I'm going to try to do this as best as possible. All right. Three more questions. So first one is my, doc <laughs> my doctor's my doctor's note to continue working from home was rejected by my company and I had to return to the office. I've teetered back and forth between doing what I'm told versus speaking up for myself and my physical and mental health. Do you have suggestions for somebody that's experiencing workplace burnout, but also frustration due to problems like this one? which I don't know who submitted this, but I'm really sorry to hear that you're going Me through too. that. Me too. Me too. I don't know the right answer for you. And what I would say is give it some thought, listen to your heart, think about what's in your control and what's not. Think about what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept and then give yourself permission to do whatever that thing is, whether it's going to work and taking care of yourself for be, you know, when you're feeling burned out or choosing not to do that at all and choosing to move on. So I would think about that and think really hard about that. Um, we also had somebody ask, I am a student government speaker of my parliament. What is the most crucial piece of advice or help on how to mitigate burnout that I can bring back to my university? Which also, I think it's great to have, you know, university level people talking about burnout. I wish when I was awesome. in my undergrad 10 years ago, I wish somebody had talked to me about burnout. I think that the, the most important couple of things would be Check in with yourself and see how you're doing. Think about, are you experiencing some of the risk factors or some of the uh, characteristics that we discussed today? And if you are, what things can you change and what things are out of your control? And if you can change things by having a talk with your boss, by shifting your responsibilities, by ensuring that if you work hard, you also play and take care of yourself and sleep right? Those are going to be the important things. Um, the last question I had for you, well, I have a small question following this one, so bear with me. Um, one of them is, can we effectively recover from burnout? How would we recognize ourselves as being recovered, burned out? I think it's going to be, it's going to be very from person to person. And I think making your job meaningful by thinking about what's important about this job to me? What do I value about this? And also building in some self-care and some time for yourself to get that work-life balance back. Um, and when you start to feel the joy coming back, and when you start to feel inspired again by what you do, um, I think that those are two signs that maybe you turned the corner with the burnout. Making it meaningful would be my advice about that. And then last but certainly not least, um, we had several people ask about Tara, the Buddhist psychologist. Oh, Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H. And they asked for you to repeat the quote, which I thought was really lovely and would be a really good way to end the session too. Sure. And it's, 
it's consider it a paraphrase because I'm sure I'm miss uh, I'm not saying this exactly correctly. So the two things that I mentioned that she said are suffering begins the moment we begin wishing the present moment is different than it is. Right? The other one is anxiety cannot live long in the present moment. So have a good day, friends. Um, enjoy <laughs> your work. You. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. I just feel my like pleasure. you're a highlight of my week every time I get to talk to you. And so I feel are like, you, Jen. Thanks. Oh, thanks. I feel like I walk away uplifted and more knowledgeable. And, you know, I feel like it makes me a better coworker and employee by being able to be empathetic and taking what I've learned from you and being able to apply it to my social circles. So thank you. I'm this really is glad. But you're very welcome. I hope it was useful for our listeners too. And you guys keep the questions coming. I love those brave souls who gave us questions today. Yep. Best so wishes thank you. to you. Thank Sending you to... lots of love and kindness. All right. Thank you Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. This actually concludes our session. Until next time, be nice to one another, but most importantly, be nice to yourself. Thanks again and have a great day.